On behalf of the Washington University Libraries and Special Collections, I would like to welcome you today to this exciting literary event. Uh, my name is Joel Miner, and I'm the curator of the Manuscripts and the Modern Literature Collection, uh, which includes the literary manuscripts of, of William H. Gass, which um, is very exciting for me. Um, it's really a treasure trove that, that Bill started donating to us almost 50 years ago uh, when the Modern Literature Collection was just getting started. And he's been uh, donating to them, to us um, ever since then. Um, so for me, uh, these manuscripts are, are, the, are the reason that I got into this profession. Um, I show them to classes and visitors every chance I get. And as you may expect, they're very rich in introspection and experimentation. And they almost speak for themselves in, in the way that they reveal the creative process behind these uh, great books like Omen Setter's Luck and uh, On Being Blue, for example. And so this past winter, we decided to put on a, uh, an exhibit um, spanning the whole career and life of, uh, of Bill Gass. And so we asked Bill and his wife, Mary, uh, for a little bit of help. And they graciously met with us more than once, uh, dug through their closets, got out some uh, fantastic items uh, to loan to us for the exhibit, um, going back to his adolescence and his Navy days um, in World War II. So I want to thank Bill and Mary not only for that, for, but also for their, uh, all their past generosity as well. Uh, it means a lot to us. You can see these manuscripts and artifacts uh, over in the exhibit, which is in Olin, um, this spring and summer. Um, we are going to be going over there after the uh, reception, or after the reading for a reception and a book signing. So um, I encourage you to take this opportunity to go over there and uh, take it in, have some food and wine, chat with Bill. Uh, get a signed copy of Middle C, uh, The Tunnel, um, Life Sentences, or almost any of his other books that will be on sale there. And if you have any questions about the exhibit or the manuscripts, uh, please feel free to ask me. I'm always happy to uh, tell you more about them, or uh, Sarah Snurriger, who uh, I have to give at least half the credit to for uh, the success of, of the exhibit. And there will also be an online exhibit coming soon, um, I promise, so be on the lookout for that. So I am pretty new to Wash U, uh, Washington University still, but I've been told that William H. Danforth and William H. Gass uh, go back a long way. And uh, they've introduced each other at more than a few events in the past. Um, in fact, we have a draft of uh, one of Bill's introductions of, Mr. Dan of Dr. Danforth in uh, his manuscripts. So um, I don't know if they take turns at this or what, but um, we're happy that um, Dr. Danforth uh, joined us today as well. We, we kind of figured if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, they work so well together. Um, so Dr. Danforth is a St. Louis native. And like, like uh, Bill, he has a, uh, a, a star in the St. Louis Hall of Fame. Um, he served Washington University first as a uh, medical, uh, on the medical faculty, and then as vice chancellor for medical affairs um, until 1971, when he was named the uh, 13th chancellor of the university. And by the time of his retirement in 1995, he had become widely recognized for his many accomplishments in growing the faculty, the endowment, the buildings, the scholarships by, by leaps and bounds. And, and really, this helped make uh, Washington University into a, a national uh, research university. And perhaps just as importantly, he, he helped uh, reinvigorate student life by attending and supporting numerous campus events and getting, getting to know the students on a personal level. Since retiring, Danforth has remained active with the university and has served as the chair of the Board of Trustees. In 1999, he was named Chancellor Emerit uh, Emeritus, and a scholarship has been named for him and his wife, Elizabeth. Danforth has, gone along, uh, has been, long been known as an advocate for academic freedom and for his uh, devotion to this university and its founders. So we couldn't be happier that he's agreed to join us today. And so please join me in welcoming Dr. William H. Danforth. Thanks very much. Thanks for the very nice introduction. Uh, just one correction. I have introduced Bill Gass many times. He has not introduced me many times. <laughs> I wouldn't have the nerve to speak if, if he introduced me, to speak after him. So the new novel, Little C, 
is an important event in the world of literature and time for us at Washington University to celebrate and to recognize again one of our most talented and distinguished faculty members. Professor William Gass, David May, distinguished university professor in the humanities emeritus. I remember the first time I heard Bill speak. I was transfixed, sitting on the edge of my chair, anxious to see how each next sentence would turn out while marveling at how words, sentences, rhythms, and sounds could evoke ideas, emotions, and meanings in new and unexpected ways. It was magic, at least it was my idea of magic, because there was no way I could figure out how he did what he did, nor could I imagine that I'd ever be able to learn how. I just thought how lucky I am to be in the same institution with this person. Later, there were times when I introduced Bill, a sure recipe for feeling inadequate, even though I knew that no one would remember what I said. At least I wouldn't be speaking after him. I'm glad, but I'm glad to be here again, speaking before him. Listening to Bill or reading or rereading his work never loses its charm, for I invariably feel that I've missed something, that I've been skating on the surface, missing what was holding the structure up. There's always more to learn next time. A few reminders. Bill earned his PhD from Cornell. His dissertation was a philosophical investigation of metaphor. He joined Washington University in 1969. He's famous worldwide, known and honored for his imaginative and arresting prose with its twists and surprises, his novels and novella, his essays and his criticism his knowledge of and opinions about well-known authors. He's translated Rilke, even though he is a member of the philosophy department. He's written on architecture and art. He's erudite, humorous, a man of deep and complex intellect. Now, all this that I just recited is known by literary people the world over. The Penn Novikov Award expressed the universal admiration Quote, celebrating the accomplishments of an author whose body of work represents achievement in a variety of literary genre and is of enduring originality and consummate craftsmanship. Now, I like the phrase enduring originality because I never thought that originality endured. But Bill's language may never be copied, so the phrase is probably okay there, but nowhere else. There's no time to go other awards, honors, and accolades. They're well known. You can look them up if you're curious. But what we at Washington University is, know is not known widely. It is that Bill Gass has meant so much to this community. Just being here on campus would have been enough, for he adds excitement and vitality, insight and wisdom to our community. He enhances the reputation of our university by the respect he commands in writers, critics, thinkers around the world. But there's much more. He's a wonderful citizen. He's taken this institution to his heart. He's poured time and effort into our students, faculty, administrators, alumni, and friends. That means donors. He's brought understanding and substance to campus events and committees. He's counseled deans and chancellors. He's inspired his colleagues, students, board members, alumni, and friends. He's put into words the essence of what a faculty of arts and sciences is and does, and given us a framework better to understand what we're about. And I'd never underestimate the importance of such a thing for any group of people. He's traveled and spoken to countless groups on behalf of the institution. He conceived and brought to world prominence the International Writers' Center at Washington University, an undertaking that added much to our campus and to the literary world. Bill and Mary Gass are both treasured president presences on our campus. I almost said presence, presences, presences on our campus. I'm fortunate to know them, so this is as good a time as any 
to thank you, Bill, for your wisdom and your work, for your talent, your caring about our work and our institution, and for contributions to Washington University. We're better because of you. Now, I thought it would be safest and uh, least intimidating to close with a quote from Bill Gass. That's the easy way out. And this is what he wrote in an email to the Los Angeles Review of Books and was printed on the 1st of April. I make some fun of the evangelical small college and the academy's love of committees, but the university is still the best place on this planet to be. It's the most civilized. There, there are idiots, of course. <laughs> but the community is full of more intelligent, sensitive, creative people, fewer dumpsters, bigots, less bad behavior than any of the world's places. Where else is equality better realized? Or where can a young mix with, a, <coughs> with and learn from somebody in their 80s? I've been especially well treated by my university, and that institution is a great patron of both the sciences and the arts. It gives the writer time. It gives the writer stimulus. Thank you. The price of the book just went up. <laughs> I'll get right to this, um, but I have to thank the Chancellor on behalf of, ex-Chancellor, uh, on behalf of the writing community, especially in university, as he supported it during all these years, and without his help, uh, we would not be known at all much. I want to begin with a few paragraphs from a talk I gave to St. Louis University's library and go on to read excerpts from Middle Sea, a novel that is our alleged excuse for being here. In short, we begin with me, mostly imaginary, and finish up with the imagined, and therefore most real me. While in graduate school at Cornell, I spent hours in the university library as PhD drudges are required to do. I had a carol, a small nick in the wall of the stacks that held a mean metal share and a bulb, a sheet of steel to write or rest a book on, a rack in front of my face for volumes taken from the shelves, but on one's honor not to be removed from the building, and a jar of hard candy whose contents were dangerous when wet. To take notes, pencils only, was a rule I was willing to observe, since unlike those of the Navy, an organization I had recently escaped from, it made sense. The building resembled a ship in some ways and bore me off smoothly. Not only were the stacks made of metal, the floor was of steel mesh that let an already worn out light sink toward a basement as distant as a bilge. Ships, uh, steps naturally rang a little unless you were in sneakers, but there were areas so removed from human interest Nutrition, for instance, it was a different era, um, that the only sounds you were likely to hear were those of the watchmen who were apparently heavy men in boots. Nevertheless, sitting there, day after day in dusky light, my conception of Eden began to change. It had no location on a map, but was a destination determined by the Dewey Decimal System. When I wasn't reading or falling asleep over a page of Lovejoy's great chain of being, I roamed up and down the metal steps, up and down the metal aisles. 
I stalked like a hunter through a dim light deemed beneficial for any volume's long interment, but barely feasible if you desired to read one. My fingers sometimes slipping along the edges of the books as a kid passing a fence might run a stick. My gaze on spines and their titles, a gaze full of wonderment that there were so many. The heavy-footed guys guarding the darkness didn't like readers to stay the night. You could nod over John Locke all afternoon, they wouldn't mind. But come 10 o'clock, they'd begin to sweep us out. First, they came scouting to see who was in the carols. They would mark you by your light. Since our little nooks were as open as a supermarket, if they didn't see you sitting there, they would turn off your lamp. Hiding at the right time by making yourself thin at the end of an aisle or fleeing to another level like an amused draft, we would wait to return only after closing. Dodging the Gestapo's heavy tread became a game. But our abilities, and I was certainly not alone in this practice, <clears throat> were put to serious use each year when the library had its book sale. I knew succession, secession, recession, possession, concession, depression, and now I was to enjoy deaccession. A room on one of the lower levels would be set aside and furnished with several large library tables. Upon them, rows of books, spines up, would be packed. The humanities fulfilled more tabletops than the sciences did, which was not a surprise because the scientists don't read, they tested, and reported their results in magazines that cost more than books. Rumors accused persons of unknown of hiding overnight in the stacks in order to be the first in line when the sale began the next morning. But that was not the worst these sneaks would sink to. They would actually take the books they wanted from one table, literature, philosophy, history, and hide them among economics or statistics. <laughs> and one person I know was accused of taking volumes entirely away to another part of the building for the night, only bringing them back as if freshly chosen the following morning. Some tell all, told all. The competition was fierce and friendship had no standing. Every book belonged to each of us and often there were juicy prizes to be taken since our teachers sometimes had the decency to die and their heirs in ignorance or indifference to dump the bulky part of the inheritance in the bins of the library. But these books would never reach the shelves. They'd be denied admittance. We already have this edition of the Maid of Orient. A writer once said about editors that out of refusal comes redemption. In this case, because the sale of books would not have been disfigured by the library's boastful black footprint, property of Cornell University Libraries, or pricked by the university's embossed seal, or pasted with a withdrawal and return record, or embarrassed by a tattoo inked on their spines as if they were headed for the boxcars. We busy buyers said we were rescuing the books that we uh, were eagerly pulling out of the pack from who knew what calamitous destiny. Not death, that was nothing. The bleakest fate was to be always available, but never molested. I have been to many library sales since and can vouch for the fact that these duplicates are rarely examined or their source respected, for out of them have fallen, as out of book fair books, treasures that sometimes surpass even their pages, not just the debris readers normally leave behind to keep their place, 
not only paper clips, kitchen matches, rubber bands, foil, curls of hair, bookmarks, bills, sucker sticks, lists, letters of love, postcards, postage stamps, gum, gum wrappers, but also photographs and threatening notices, greenbacks, checks, and a draft of a telegram to be sent to the Allied High Commissioner asking him to expedite the transport of Werner Heisenberg out of Germany, which fluttered to the, my floor when I riffled one of Arthur Holly Compton's books after purchasing it for 50 cents at a Washington University purge. Collectors who do not care for books, but only for their rarity, prefer them in an unopened, in a pure and virginal condition. But such volumes have had no life, and now even that one chance has been taken from them, so that imprisoned by stifling plastic, priced to flatter the vanity of the parvenu who has made its purchase, it sits out of the light in a glass-enclosed humidor like wine, too old to open, too expensive to enjoy. Now I want to go to Middle C. Like my first novel, Omen Setter's Luck, this book is written in several styles. The library section is more traditional, more he said, she said. My character, a young man, Joey, sometimes Joseph, is a school dropout and a very amateur pianist who has just got a job in the library. It doesn't matter for this occasion, but you should be warned that much of what Joseph says when he is being interviewed for the job has the reality of a frequent liar. He isn't as smart, as old, as confident as he pretends to be. Two women, Miss Bruce, Miss Moss, manage the library. They are at war with one another. Miss Bruce is a boss. The people call her Major. These paragraphs in the novel are scattered about. I've gathered them together for this occasion. The library brought Josie Joey Skizen happiness. It is true he had no instrument available to him now or a place to play, though he exercised his fingers daily and caught every radio concert he could. So his music was not utterly neglected. The head librarian, Marjorie Bruss, presented a trim figure in her white blouse, navy slacks and jacket, and her halo of hair. Joseph liked her rosy complexion, her warm yet brisk manner, her play with words. Her speech was clipped but low, her face round as a dial, her smile consequently wide, and her lips had many expressive positions. She wore shoes with very soft soles and moved about quickly, but with almost as much discretion as Miss Moss, another librarian, managed. She saw Joseph's ball point and took it from his shirt pocket where it was clipped. No pens in the library. Pens are poison. We permit only pencils with soft leads and dull points, so any marks they make can be easily erased. Everybody? The rule is for everybody. We can't frisk our customers. I wouldn't want to put my hands on some, but in the reading room or anywhere, if you see someone taking notes with a pen, you must caution them. Highlight, in the, uh, indeed, highlighters. Highlighters are evil. They must be immediately confiscated and their users given a talking to, even if they are marking up their own books or some harmless paper copies. Oh, Marjorie raised her hand to heaven. How I hate highlighters. You don't use them, do you? Joseph wagged his head. Good, she said, good sign. 
The dog ear people do it. Stupid students do it. And they will grow dog ears in due time. <laughs> you don't do dogs, do you, Joseph? <clears throat> we never could afford a pet, Joseph said. <laughs> good sign, good sign. Dogs are bad for books. Don't ever do dogs. They chew. Cats are bad, too. They claw. They love to rub their chins on the corner of covers, leave sneezers of fur, rub their chins, and grin at you. Before they fade from view, Joseph said, oh, you are a darling. I kiss the night nearby air, Marjorie exclaimed. But it would not be for the last time. The neighboring air got many a smooch. Marjorie's approval made Joey happy. He was a success. Do not lean with heavy hands or rest your elbows on a book, even closed, even at apparent peace. You know why, I suppose. Uh, it compresses the covers against the spine and may crack the adhesive. Oh, do not use a book as a writing board. Points can make indentations, especially, you'd be surprised, on jackets, many of which are waxy, slick, easily marked, for example, with a fingernail. And never put your note paper on an open book even to write a word. A dozen crimes in one action there. I, I wouldn't do that. Open books are so uneven. Never mark in a book, not your own. But even then, unless you think you're Coleridge, never make a marginal note or a clever remark that you will surely regret. And always assume the author is smarter than you are. Have you written a book on his subject? Well, so put down your differences on a piece of paper made for the purpose, or keep the quarrel quietly in your head, where it will bother you, only you, and never fluster another, not even your future self, who will have forgotten the dispute, you can be sure, and will not wish to be reminded. <laughs> yes, ma'am, Marjorie. Not miss, Ms. or ma'am, Marjorie. Marjorie. It was a nice name, he thought, well syllabled. Don't put your palms down on illustrations, reproductions, any page at all, really, because even the most fastidious sweat, men sweat the most. Women have more discipline over their bodies. Did you know that? Except for their hands. Their hands are public advertisements. They encounter a porcupine, a precipice, a proposal, and their palms get runny. Oh, yes, and in the old days, when men kissed a lady's hand, <clears throat> it was the top of it they put their lips to, not the palm. You never know where the palm has been or what it's been wrapped around. Well, where was, uh, be wary, inks may smear, pig pigments flake, thumb oils may seep into the paper, Leaving prints and sweat attracts insects, did you know? Also, there may be a fungus in the neighborhood. Sweat is a magnet. Gee, I didn't know that. Joseph, that is your last G. Never even feel G. You are a grown-up. Okay, okay. Okay is also out. G. okay. Marjorie laughed like a wind chime. Good man, she said, good man. Joseph had brought some new books to the basement for shelving. Miss Moss materialized beside him. Ah, Miss Moss, how are you? Every day is the same, she whispered, as if she were sharing a secret. Well, I suppose they are down here. No. The basement leaks a little when it rains. Isn't that bad for the books? Well, it would be if the books knew where the leaks were. I, uh, Joseph felt himself in the middle of an admission 
of misunderstanding when it occurred to him that if the paper should sense and seek out nearby dampness, then if it could, Miss Moss's point of view might, you are shelving these? Yes, that's right, because I re-shelve. I make all the re-adjustments. I dust them first, she flourished a rag, and then I wipe them all over. That's capital. It was another expression he'd encountered in an English novel. Miss Moss tried, he thought, to fix him with a look, but she had uneven eyes. Capital of what? I meant they'd be well wiped then. Of course, I would not wipe otherwise, she said softly but firmly while moving off. She always lowered her voice as a sign she was about to leave you. It was like slowly closing a door. These are first timers, for down here I mean, new to the stacks. He had begun to explain, but she was gone. It was perhaps the bare inadequate bulbs that created her insubstantiality, in which case he was less material too. You must not, Marjorie had advised him, pack the books too tightly together on the shelf. They must slide out easily. Dyes will rub off or surfaces scrape. A browser is bound to pull them out by tugging on the head cap. Actually, they'll do it anyway. Their index finger shoots out and hooks the poor thing backward, weakening or even breaking the cap, tips the book out topsy-turvy. How would you like that? Some tend to hook the book by the tail cap which is thereby determined to tear. Worse, women who wear their nails long, who have nothing to do but file and paint, love to claw books forth by clutching their sides, and in the process, puncture the cloth. You see? Where it rolls in at the hinge, it is loose, soft, and unprotected there. Such dismaying creatures. I quite understand. Read, Joseph, read, but don't use the words you read in front of a casual public. The words you read and the way they are written are rarely meant to be spoken out loud in ordinary life, the way one says hi or how are you with careless or indifferent intent. You may say it was quite large. That's all right. Quite. Good. You are a good Joseph today. You shall earn a cookie. Now then, where, where, where was I? Oh, books must not be shelled so loosely. They lean lazily to one side. That will cause them to become separated from their backbones and to braid their tail edges. Look here. She held up a volume by its covers, and he could see how its pages hung down like fish on a string. So. Remember to hold them as you hold your honey, not too loosely and not too tightly. I haven't got a honey. You've got a mother, maybe. <laughs> Joseph learned that Marjorie puffed her cheeks while thinking ahead. She did that now. Then, don't. I'm sure you won't. Pick up a book by just one board and be sure to carry heavy folios with both hands. By the way, you might think that turning pages is easy and obvious and needn't be learned, a cinch to master, you might think, but people regularly tear wide pages by pulling too fiercely and too sharply down on them. I can tell because the tear tears will come about a fourth of the way along the top from the spine. Thick books have deep creases so the book is fair, rarely fully open. So when holding a book, especially when turning the pages, do not put your thumb in the gutter, Marjorie demonstrated. The page rolled awkwardly over even her small thumb. Hands are important here, Joseph ventured. Ah, yes, good. Your hands will get dusty in this world of ours, and you will need to wash them often. Not just for the book's sake, 
you'll suffer paper cuts, infection sites, a nuisance but a peril of the job. You've probably seen the notices I've put up in the bathrooms, yes? Dusk jackets uh, weren't idly named. We do risk the jackets for the first few weeks when the books are NAs, because even protected, they'll nick or fade a little. But then, after the volumes come back here to the open stacks, we store the jackets in basement boxes as if they were winter wear. Miss Moss, if she chooses, Miss Moss can show you where. Have you encountered Miss Moss? Uh, yes, I have. We, we allow pencils, but watch out for the readers, usually women, who use the eraser to capture the corners and roll pages over, or worse, who lick their fingers. Admonish them, be gentle, but admonishment is necessary. Ah, uh, I know the word jokes. Do I have my hair in a bun with a pencil thrust through it? But we have to admonish, we have to shush. We have few funds and can't replace books readily, so we must be particular, and we haven't the space to keep duplicates. We've got to sell them off, you know. Send them on their way. Patrons are always giving us duplicates. Miss Moss is in charge of the poor things, as well as the old folks and the orphans. Sometimes I think she is a faint, late duplicate herself. You dust each book when you put it back, Joseph asked Miss Moss, having thought of nothing better to say. Yes, I indeed do. I do, which is to tell you twice. I, I guess you did. I wipe them with this rag that Major doesn't like. She wants me to use the vac. Noisy, awkward to carry about, I suppose. Because the rag just rubs it in, she says, pushes the dust down between the pages. Dust will work its way into the least crack or crevice, but I wipe it in anyway. The top ends get gray as do we all including the major. Why shouldn't they show their age? Well, yes, you're certainly right about that. You don't really think so. I'm sure you side with the major. Well, I, I really haven't sides. We all have sides. I am at least hexagonal. Well, that many? Those who go to the well all too often, often fall in. Uh, Yes, well uh, warned. Major wants me to fashion cheesecloth over the nose of the hose and then push the attachment in. Really? Why? That seems extreme. The Major is extreme. If any fragments of paper, cloth, or leather fly off when I'm hosing, they will be caught in the net of the cheese. Of course, they'd be minute and of no worth, even if they were pasted back where they belong. Well, that is clever, very clever. Miss Moss held her switch, swatch aloft. I am clever too. Joseph now noticed how streaked her cloth was. Miss Moss had turned her back. Her dust rag lolled over her thin so shoulder like a small towel. Marjorie'd have us wear white gloves if she wouldn't have to wear them. <clears throat> no, Marjorie would have, have us wear white gloves if she wouldn't have to wash them. Miss Moss managed to dial her voice up for that remark. As far as the library goes, I guess, she thinks all books are fine ones. Joseph thought Miss Moss hissed. She certainly sailed out of sight. Her world must be flat because she disappeared all at once rather than a bit at a time. Oh my, she said as if in deep distress, I'm going to have to show you how to load a book truck. Don't balance the books on the heads of other books as you've done here. They aren't practicing to improve their posture. 
And if you row them like this, with their four edges down, see how the entire content hangs from the spine? These days, so many books are glued instead of sewn, and it is particularly hard on them to do what bats do. On the other hand, if you put them spine down on the truck, the back gets roughed up, the corners of the boards are also exposed, and these points are the most easily bumped and dented. That will happen to them soon enough. You can't know yet what people inflict on the poor things. Marjorie has told me some it's Marjorie, but it's Miss Moss. Well, I don't doubt. I don't doubt that she so told you. I don't doubt it. During this instruction, many of Miss Moss's mannerisms disappeared, and she seemed neither nervous, skittish, nor shy, nor did she break her words to elongate their vowels. Had she learned her cautions from Marjorie? or had Marjorie learned them from her. A certain malevolent glow suffused her features so that she grew younger and her complexion less blue whenever she spoke about her present position, its obligations, its rituals, trials, and its powers. A book, you would think, is not a pocket, a purse, or a wastebasket. But people dispose of their sniffle-filled Kleenex wads between unexposed pages, their toothpicks too, dirty where they've gripped them while cleaning their teeth. Such indecency. Matchbooks with things written on the underside of the flap, usually numbers of telephones, I suppose, curls of hair and all sorts of receipts, as well as other slips of paper they've used to mark the spot where they stopped, and they file correspondence between leaves as if a book were a slide drawer. Do they do that to their own books? Or they tuck snapshots, postcards, unused stamps into them, now and then a pressed bloom they stain. I've seen leaf shadows, one to five to ten dollar bills, you'd never guess. Yes, rubber bands, the shoelace, candy and gum wrappers, even their chewed gum that I have to pry out with a putty knife. People, people, I declare. And newspaper clippings, often the author's reviews, that are among the worst intruders because in time they'll sulfur the pages where they've been compressed the way people who fall asleep on the grass of a summer morning leave their prints for the use of sorcerers like me to make our magic. I've seen those cardboard colored shadows. Don't overload the truck. Her arm, as if it were all cloth, waved over the row of waiting books. When the reshelvers arrive, those that have been out in uncaring public hands, I hold up the, uh, each volume up by its boards and shake it. Yes, just as if I were tipping a purse in a hunt for keys, and let the cellophane flutter forth, the strips of foil, all their nasty personal stuff spill out. It is not easy on the books, but their bodies are purged, and they will all be better for it. She gave Joseph an impish look. I talk to them, I do. When I repair a book, I tell it what the operation entails and how it won't hurt. They need to be shown some concern. She paused as if in obedience to a script, as if she'd confessed these things before. They need talking to, not just reading from. She paused again. They need consolation. With such instructors, it didn't take Joseph long to learn the ropes, and he soon found, as he thought he would, that he had time on his hands. His dedication and energy enabled him to dispose of tasks as, as they appeared, and even when he looked for work by asking what he should do next, 
that was often accomplished more effectively than either patrons or staff expected. Through nearly all the hours he found free in his otherwise broken day, he read difficult books, those that would compel him to take notes. He checked out on his own card and took back to his rooms for concentrated study. This pass, a prize document, had his photo on it and in hollow red letters said, Staff. Time, too, became real and its paradoxes fascinating. He had in hand, for instance, a book of Ruskin's originally issued in 1850s. Meanwhile, Shaw and Shakespeare sat close by with volumes about them from every ensuing decade. Yet all of these works were here, were here in the sight of his eye so that he, Joseph Schizen, might read Shaw before Shakespeare, Pinero before Sophocles, the little or the late before the long ago and very great, because for him the past, which he surely recognized and honored as historical, was as real right now as it once had been. The past was present in an altered form, of course, but Ruskin's words on Ruskin's page were the same as the day Ruskin wrote them, as was his dislike of geometric form expressed by him with such conviction. In these fulminations, Euclid's tidy squares, his petty rounds and triangles were set against the exfoliate nature and shape of plants, animals, and even men, as if the two realms were enemies, the abstract versus the organic for the title in 15 rounds. This bout was as present to Joseph's mind as it might have been to one of Ruskin's immediate readers. The past is present on the page, he told Marjorie. This library is like the savior, the whole dead world has risen and stands here as on the last day. Marjorie's smile was chaperoned by a pair of moist eyes. Thank you for your patience.